32 years ago, I started a not-for-profit organization called FIRST. I called it FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology because I thought at the time that this country was totally misguided when all of our political leaders back then, all of our business leaders, all our education leaders thought the, everybody knew we we're producing way too few scientists and engineers. This country was gonna lose its position, which we've seen what's happened now. And they all said it's an education crisis. I'm, a, uh, I'm an inventor, right? What do inventors do? Inventors look at the same problems as everybody else and see them differently. My mom is a teacher. And, you know, I would sit at home and say, do you really think suddenly we have an education crisis in this country? Even back then, 32 years ago, we spent more money per capita on education, public education, than any country in the world. I said, it's not an education crisis, it's a culture crisis. And it's not what we don't have enough of, schools, textbooks, it's what we have too much of, distractions and false heroes. Mm -hmm. And the only people that little kids 30 years ago, and now at the internet it's even worse, the only superheroes they could name came from the NBA, the NFL, or Hollywood. And in a free country where you get the best of what you celebrate, we celebrate sports and entertainment, which is why the US produces great sports and great entertainment. Yeah, physics and math, and not so much. So I said, kids love sports, let's just turn physics and math and science into a sport. I thought it would be easy. We would do it a year of example. People would see how much fun it is if you did it as an after-school aspiration event, just like football or basketball. And I just thought, this is a no-brainer, and everybody will adopt it. It'll be as fun as any other sport, but it'll be the only sport where every kid on every team can turn pro. So this is a good deal. And it grew from 23 teams in year one to 50 to 100 to 200 because I needed mentors. I needed superstars in my sport, like baseball and football have them, and Hollywood has them. But we were reaching a point where I needed more media attention, we needed more resources, and he's referring to a conversation I had with him at the time, and I said, Peter, you have to help me get more awareness for first. And he did, and every year since, we've worked together, and it's grown this year, and everybody makes fun of me when I take out my little, this year, March Madness, we're in the middle of it, the season got so big that instead of my one little card with the front being first and the back, which was for the first five years, come to Manchester with the 23 teams, you now have to open it up and look at the schedule for 2024, and you see 182 cities holding events, for 82,000 schools. 82,000 schools. With 200,000 volunteer mentors. We gave out $80 million in scholarships down on, on uh, Scholarship Row last year at the championship in Houston, where it will be this year from the 17th to the 20th of April. Um, it's an incredible collection of passionate parents, teachers, community leaders. Every one of the Fortune 500 tech companies is a big sponsor. and. I'm gonna show a quick video of what we did to get first thank you, sir. up bigger and better. And I really thank you for giving me this opportunity because you're all gonna end up with homework in a couple of minutes out of this. <laughs> yes, but, Dr. But, Kimmy. But what happened was, after about 25 years of running first, because almost every big company is multinational, I would go to the championships and there'd be teams from 40 or 50 countries. And that's because, you know, the big companies were, uh, uh, they're international, so they would send the kids around. I ended up being in Israel at one point, and before he passed with Shimon Perez, and by then there were 500 or 600 teams in Israel, and by the way, the Palestinians, they were all working together. He then says to me, it's not good enough that after 25 years you only have 40 or 50 countries Dean, this should be an international sport like the Olympics, and every country in the world needs to participate. Under the condition that he agreed to be my honorary chair, I founded a, a sister organization to FIRST called FIRST Global. And I said, I'm going to get one team from every country in the world. I thought that's a modest goal, 54 countries in Africa, one team per country, 24 countries in the Middle East, one team. And I'm going to show a quick... Uh, um, um, set of pictures, but besides first, as I just told you, being on a, on a tear in this country, and by the way, uh, somebody give me my little kit, quick. Ah. Um, 
Year after year, I've said we ought to have first in every school in the United States. It's a cheaper sport than football or basketball. You have less likelihood of breaking your knees or necks. Let's, let's make this in every school. Finally, over the last year, I was able to work internally to create kits where for less than $100, we can build a very sophisticated process I'll of board. And I went to our governor in New Hampshire, and when I told him what we could build a robot kit for, the governor of New Hampshire, and this is public now, and you'll see it, said, Dean, you've been beating on us for years to make it a standardized sport like the others. If you can give us a kit like that with the curriculum to go with it, and kids love building things like this, he said, it's under 100 bucks for you to build it. I said, yeah, we'll give them to you at whatever they cost. The governor of New Hampshire said, we're not going to put a first team in every school we're going to put a first kit in every classroom in the state. And we did it this year. This kit costs less than a typical textbook. And kids don't even open textbooks. They're not relevant. But they do hardware. They do software. They do development. They work in teams. And knowing that you've got little kids, you now have a Thank first you. robot kit. And we're going to be trying to get other governors to make this a standardized national sport. But back to First Global. And by the way, let me just ask you guys, as we're going through this, uh, please post your questions and upvote questions in the, in the app, if you would, if you've got questions popping up in your head. I just want to make sure I get us out of here on time for the party, and I can never stop Dean from talking about first. So, so, so after, after, sadly, he passed away a year before that, but I said, let's invite every country in the world to send one team, and I figured we better do the first one in the U.S., because I needed support. And I thought I'd get 30 or 40 countries. I got 136. I was desperate. I rented, I rented Constitution Hall in Washington, and we had 136 country, countries there. The following year, next slide, we said, we're moving. It's an international thing like the Olympics. It has to move every year. Can you play the next slide? Maybe they can't. Uh, it's, yeah, there we are behind you. Okay, anyway, we went to Mexico City. There it is. We had 166 countries, and on that stage is Anoush Ansari, by the way, who's helped us every year. The following year, we didn't have 166 countries. We went to Dubai, the belly of the global beast, the Middle East, and we made a deal with the royal family that every country in the world is going to be invited and treated well, and so all 24 countries in the Middle East, including Israel, is in that arena. We had 191 countries. We had 190 countries, but 191 teams, because one team from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, we would always line them up alphabetically for opening ceremonies like the Olympics. They, and as the guy is reading from, he gets to the ages, Haiti and Hong Kong, Honduras, he reads, Team Hope. And a bunch of kids walk across the stage with their flag, but their flag was our first logo. And he's reading that. This is Team Hope. These students have no country. They grew up in a refugee camp in Syria. They have no country but they have hope. So they are Team Hope, and they've been with us every year. So it gets better. It gets better. We had a couple of years of COVID, and then the year that we came back, which is a year and a half ago now, we said, let's go to a safe place to restart. So we went to Geneva, a place that convenes the world. So we did that, and at the end of that, event, I always feel compelled to remind people it's not about the robots, it's about bringing the world together, it's about important things. So I'm standing on this stage, and you'll see why this is important, in Geneva, and I'm looking out at 190 flags being waved. And I said, hey everybody, we just finished a great time, you've proven that you all know how to get along with each other, sharing parts, sharing ideas, teaching each other, you're way better than your parents and grandparents, uh, but maybe you'll break this never-ending cycle. But I said, for next year, just to remind everybody we're not about the robots, I'm going to ask you to sign two what I think are that necessary international agreements. And I said, I'm an American, and I'm proud of being an American, but I am not going to uh, you know, force on any other country my background or heritage or traditions. But we need something that will be a complement to two documents that I grew up with in America. One is the Declaration of Independence. And we collectively, with 190 countries, by the way, I said, we need 
to recognize that while you all need in your country to have your independence and diversity and your language and your culture, keep it all and be proud of it all. But your generation's growing up in a world where pandemics don't stop at the end of an arbitrary line. Go look at what NASA's picture. And, and, and global warming affects everybody no matter where you created the mess. So I said, your generation's gonna grow up with a declaration of interdependence and those things that you need to share and support, you're all gonna to agree to do or we're not gonna do this again. I said, there's another document we have in America that I really grew up with and appreciate and it's the Bill of Rights. And I hope in your own countries, whatever is an appropriate set of rights that you're willing to protect and you should do that. But in our ever more intense global environment, you're all gonna grow up in a generation that needs a bill of responsibilities and you need to mm. be responsible to know the truth and speak the truth and respect the truth and respect each other even when you, you differ. So between now and next year, we're going to make two documents, a declaration of interdependence and a bill of responsibilities and it will be a universal pair of documents that every country, every team is gonna sign or they can't participate in First Global. I did not know at the time that one year later, we would start the 2023 event in Singapore. I flew for 22 hours, I got there, everybody's excited, I go to the arena the night before, I'm looking at them setting up for opening ceremonies on October 6th. The following morning, October 7th, I'm watching as opening ceremony starts and alphabetically these teams are walking across the stage including Iran, Iraq and Israel and my phone is lit up, Hamas invades Israel. And is it fate, Pete, Peter? All I know is I was in a room much bigger than this with kids from every country in the world communicating, cooperating and working together looking at BBC telling us that the world is about to go into its worst self-destructive mode since World War II. For the next three days, we had our event, and by the end of the third day, I was sure I had made giant, like, tablets of those two documents and lines with typewritten Afghanistan to Zimbabwe under them, 191. And I told every team, not knowing what was happening on the evening of the 6th when we set it up, on the morning of the 7th, I said, you're all gonna have to sign on these. We've agreed to open the internet all year. Well, by the third day, I got there on the 10th. The global news was horrific. But you'd go in and you could feel the energy and the support and the cooperation. We started closing ceremonies in Singapore. I was so afraid I'd walk out and I would see some, any one group, any one, would have destroyed those tablets or would have put graffiti on them or worse. I walked out, people, and every single line, every country had a signature in it. And I said to the people, pack these things up and protect them and send them back to me. I don't know if I'm gonna deliver them to the United Nations. No, they're dysfunctional. I'll bring it to <laughs> Washington. I'll, no. I now have them in the lobby of my building. Maybe I'll give them to the Institute of Peace. But I want you to, I, this is closing ceremonies, and I can give you all copies. Those four tablets are the declarations of interdependence and the Bill of Responsibilities, and there are 191 signatures on them.